tie them together with companies that provide what we call smart technologies, for lack of a better word. And it's basically all the new technologies that are emerging that can make cities more efficient, more effective, better to live in, and so on. In the beginning, this was, it was very technology oriented. It was about applications, mobile services. Increasingly, it's also becoming about new models, new ways of doing things, ways of creating agricultural tourism and so on to, to stir economy and so on. So it's very broad. And basically what we're trying to do, we're trying to create a global market for smart ideas, innovations, actual solutions, and try and open up public procurement to being more international. And I'll show you how we do this. It's a, I think it's, in a way it's a different approach and in a way it's, it's, there's not much magic to it. But we're having quite success with it. And um, we currently we work with, uh, I can show you the numbers in, in a second, we work with 65 uh, cities across the world. Some of them huge cities like Lakas in Nigeria, 15 million people. Some of them smaller cities, 30,000 uh, inhabitants. So um, it's just to say, uh, this, can, this is something that is relevant to large cities and it's something that is relevant to small communities as well. You know, there are no barriers. And basically what we're trying to do is to create a more efficient society, a more livable society, and to solve many of the challenges. So we've, I mean, I, I heard the, many of the comments and questions in the last session and it was very procurement, procurement oriented. And I think we are actually, we have a different approach to it. It's much more all the things that go, goes on before you make the tender, before you actually go out and say, this is what we want. And we, we've done that, and I will also show you, because we for many years worked with this challenge, you know. <coughs> why, is, why is procurement such a challenge? Why are we not procuring internationally? Why are we not always getting the best solution? All the questions that were asked here, and we, you know, that, that's our experience. We found out that actually a lot of the interesting things happened before the actual tender is published for many different reasons, both, uh, you know, legal and less <laughs> legal reasons. Um, I have an, an interesting story to bring here. So Copenhagen just launched a new electronic uh, ticketing system. It cost the taxpayers of Copenhagen 200 million pounds. 200 million pounds. The technology is obsolete at the time. It was implemented recently. It's, it's been you know, it took five years for them to develop it. It's already obsolete because, you know, today you can buy your ticket with your mobile phone, which anyone, the majority of, of uh, people that use public transportation do. But that's not the worst problem. So it costs taxpayers, including me, I live in Copenhagen, 200 million pounds. That's not the worst problem. What is the worst problem here? What is the worst problem? It's not the money. I wasn't asked. No one asked me as a citizen, do I want this ticketing system? Does it solve my problem? Is it great? Is it amazing? <coughs> he just did it, you know? And it's probably, you know, create, I don't know, you know, it puts money into innovation and so on. It's primarily done with, you know, international companies that have local, you know, affiliates. If you go into the, the Danish procurement side, you will only see national companies or kind of, you know, local affiliates of big companies and so on. No damage to them. But no one asked me whether I wanted this system, and I can tell you, I don't. And I can see from the take-up in Copenhagen that no one else wants it. So why waste the money? Why implement the system? Why force it through? Good question. Now, fortunately and unfortunately, I'm not the only person with that problem. Um, these are our numbers, right? So I'm just giving you our worldview, and that can be right or wrong. You know, we've done a lot of research, so we hope it's right. <laughs> Otherwise, we've been wasting our time. But we are working, you know, our market, what we are working with is over half a million local oh, communities, local governments, you know, in any form, cities, regions, local communities, and what they spend on procurement of smart services. So it's one market within the massive amounts of money they spend on procurement of all kinds of things. And we heard a lot of the areas that here today, you know, where you're also spending in construction and so on. So currently we own in smart services, you know. It's not to say in the future we might not work with a lot of other areas, but this is what we're good at. This is, this is the market we understand. 
And our numbers show that out of the um, $150 billion they spend on smart services today, which is destined to grow with the whole smart cities uh, kind of emergence and, and new technologies introduced, our numbers are that they, they waste around $70 billion of that is wasted. It's <coughs> money that's spent where they get no value. You know, that's, you know, I saw the lean consultant here, and that's probably a big part, big chunk of this can be, you know, that market just making, you know, making sure they're smarter in the way they procure, but a lot of other reasons. And we think that's a lot of money, and we want to change that. There is also another side to what we're doing. We actually want to do more. We don't just want to, you know, save the taxpayers' money. We also want to create a better world, right? And that's whenever we're trying to raise financing, people start going, you know, where did you come from? But we actually calculated um, that, you know, if we can save this, if we can save just 1.5% of these budgets, we can actually solve the world's basic problems, right? So it's a lot of money. It can be used in a lot of other places than just wasting them on inefficiency and technologies we do not want. So there is, there is not just an economic incentive for us to do this, you know, there is a social incentive here. We should do it. You know, we are morally in some way obliged to do this in one way or the other. At least that's what we remind ourselves when we kind of know <laughs> things are not going too well, that we have to do it. <clears throat> this is some of the research we've done. We, um, and it's, it's in this book. So in this book, we looked at four areas. We looked at social procurement and green procurement, which is not relevant from here. Then we looked at public procurement in general for innovation, and then we also looked at electronic procurement. And it's those two areas where we kind of work. That's our ball game. So I will just give you some of the, some of the uh, results we had when we looked around Europe and interviewed companies and uh, um, uh, public organizations to come up with some of the knowledge that, that they had, that they wanted to share, some of the main challenges. And you will probably recognize many of these. I apologize for the small text. This is taken directly from the book. right? But it's challenges such as flawed awareness and market intelligence. You know, if you're a public official, where do you go? If you want to procure a great service, where do you go? You know, there is no website. Well, there is a merging one, as I will show you later. But there's no place you can go like the Amazon to see all the books that are available within a particular field. Right? Many of the companies that are selling these services, you know, they don't have the funding to, to market this around the world. Many of the companies that invent great services you know, don't have the money to find the cities in the world that are actually interested in buying the product, right? We have several examples of companies that have gone nowhere for years until they were kind of picked up and taken international in some way or the other. Other areas like lack of commitment to innovation. I think we, there were some discussions about uh, contracts, cost plus contracts and so on that could be challenges, but also other things, you know, why, why is the city spending money? You know, one pattern we see is that sometimes it's actually not about the innovation, it's political reasons. You know, we want to show that we put money into creating jobs or local innovation and so on and so forth. And I'm an economist and when I look at that I say, this is the worst thing you can do, right? It will generate absolutely nothing for your local economy that you take, you know, money from the companies that are profitable and put them into a lot of other areas that you think can stimulate the economy, right? You have to be really good at predicting you know, what could be the winners of tomorrow if you want to, uh, you know, pursue that policy. And, you know, then you can ask yourself, uh, are the, you know, the experts in predicting that also the ones that are allocating public budgets? Perhaps, perhaps not. Other challenges like cost sharing, but perhaps also this is extremely important. Markets are not truly open. Now, one of the, we travel around the world. Um, I travel a lot and I have to send an SMS every time I land to my wife saying I arrived safely. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, disregarding where I go, we often see the challenge that there is a huge incentive for a city to get an idea, say, wow, this is a great idea. Go down to the local shop and say, can you build this? Right? Because if we build this locally, we could sell it internationally. Right? And that makes no sense to me. I mean, in Europe, we have 50 different parking solutions for major cities where you can pay with your mobile phone. And it was invented in Estonia. You know, they traveled around to all these cities trying to, to they had a problem that simply paying for parking, you know, the amount of money you needed to put in there was so much that, you know, 
you couldn't carry it around. So they invented it. They were the first ones, very you know, agile in the mobile sector for many reasons and so on. They went around Europe trying to sell their systems. Nobody bought it. But they invented their own shortly after. Right? And you can say, well, you know, that's great because then we stimulate the local economy and so on, the usual political uh, 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 you know, arguments for this. But on a European scale, this is a disaster. You know, of course, we want competition, but we don't want every city to spend the same <coughs> money on developing the same technologies. It's a huge waste. You know, we all know how much it costs to innovate. You know, rather, we'd want to differentiate ourselves a little and put our money into areas where we can be different. So, <coughs> challenge. So that's kind of that is the one. That is the one side. Um, we can come back to the recommendations. Then, if we go to electronic procurement, and and I know this also touches on some of the the areas that were here. You know, why do we do electronic procurement? Well, we all know that. You know, we want to save uh, you know costs. We want to you know have better ways of sourcing and so on and so forth. There are many reasons to do it. <coughs> um, but there are also challenges here. I mean, first of all, I, I gave you the example of, of SKI, the Danish portal, and you can also see that in, in the book that is freely available. We went through all the companies there. I think there are a little over a thousand companies. There might be more today, you know. This is an electronic portal. It's supposed to be international. The, the portal in, in itself is in English, okay? So it's one of the EU languages. It's international. Many of the contracts put out there are in Danish, you know. The only companies that are there are either local Danish companies or affiliates of IBM or you know some of the other big players there. There are no SMEs. You know there was a, there was a comment here that uh, Scotland, for example, was is a country of SMEs. Right? That was what I understood. There are no SMEs in that portal. But many of the projects, many of the tenders that are put out there, could actually be interesting for SMEs in Scotland or other, in other places in Europe. They're not there. They're not even registered. They don't even put their name there. So they are not even eligible to receive updates and so on and so forth. You know. <clears throat> so that is, that, is, uh, that is where we come from. We say, you know, what is happening here? Right? This is a citizen of Minnesota. She's blind. She has uh, three roots that um, she has rehearsed, so that she can walk every day from her home to three places that are relevant for her. Minnesota got the White Cane Award for this solution. You know, the kind of the mark that they did something specially from the blind. This is Boris. He lives in Stockholm. Boris is also blind. Boris has a very, very different life because he's 100% mobility. He can move freely across Stockholm. That's amazing. It's great. He can have a job. He can actually, he does need assistant, uh, assistance and so on to live his life. Here's a company called eAdept. They have developed this solution. Very precise navigation for Boris. Completely changed his quality of life. So why is this relevant? Well, it's relevant on a lot of areas. First of all, visually impaired get completely different quality of life. But beyond that, we get a lot more. We tried to do a, a study where we actually looked at, we got numbers um, uh, from the company and from public authorities and looked at what are the economic benefits to Stockholm. And it's 16 million euros to get the 7,500 uh, visually impaired in Stockholm <coughs> to move around. That's the benefit of implementing the system. It, it costs around 300,000 euros to implement, right? So it's a massive, it's a massive return on investment. <clears throat> but it's more, because if we look around the world on the numbers of blind and visually impaired, the economics of this becomes huge. And we tried to do the study. We looked at New York City, Tokyo, San Francisco, Washington, D.C. What is the potential economic impact to some of these cities if they procure these solutions? It's huge. It's massive. And then you ask yourself, why haven't they bought it? Why haven't they bought it? I mean, it makes so much sense. And I would bet you, if you ask you know, the 383,000 visually impaired in New York whether they would like this solution, what would they say, yes or no? Most likely say, we would like that. They haven't been asked. Nobody asked them. Nobody told them they was there. Nobody asked them. At the same time, 
This is some of our own numbers, you know. If you have a challenge in a city, what is a factor by which uh, companies outside of your own country have solutions that might solve that challenge? And this is, this is from Living Labs Global. These are the number of solutions that are submitted to the global challenges of cities that we uh, disseminate. So it might, you know, we don't have all the companies in our, in, in our database, so there might be additional solutions out there. But for Europe, an average city get 40 times the number of solutions served internationally than they get just by national reach. If it locally, it's even less. In the US, 300 times, you know, and in other places, immeasurable. Right? So our conclusion is the market fails. It's simply not working, and that's why we have and that's what we're trying to solve. This is another case study. This is actually from the company that invented the, um, uh, this kind of mobile, uh, mobile solution for parking places that I told you about. And this is the number of cities they went to to try and sell it. They went to around 1,000 cities to try and pitch this. Uh, 130 cities said we might be interested, and this led to 11 contracts. Right? This is one guy traveling around the world spending a lot of time going to all these cities, and he spent a lot of money just to get a no. And we said, something can be done here. And this is, of course, large, a large part of the money that we believe are wasted on public procurement, because in one way or the other, those, those costs have to be reflected in the prices in the end to make sure you know, the whole ecosystem works or the whole market works. So that's our mission. We want to change that. So what we're trying to do in Living Labs Global is that we are, going, we are trying to take solutions such as Now Innovations, you know, mobile system, e-adept uh, uh, navigation system for the blind, and com combine that with cities that have the needs for these systems. We're trying to create that market since for some reason it's not working. We know why, why it's not. You know, local protectionism is very expensive to market yourself internationally and so on, and we want to change that. <coughs> And we think we can do that. And it has a lot to do with the phase before you actually make the tender and say, we want this. That's our mission. Will we achieve it? Let's see in five years. Otherwise, we'll have a beer and say, damn it, didn't work. So what are we doing? <clears throat> First of all, in Living Apps Global, we started, this is kind of the small scale initiative, I would say. So we started with finding cities that are open to this. We have one here today. Barcelona, we'll hear more about that in a second, to so say, what are your challenges? Then we'll take them international. We'll find companies that have solutions that match these challenges. And you can have your pick. You can say which of these companies are interesting for us. And you can select one, and that you can pilot to see, does it work? You can show it to your citizens. You can, you can test it locally before you go into procurement. Right? We know you cannot promise this company that you will buy the solution, but it's a huge step to take a company from Hawaii, go all the way to Lagos to reinvent their, you know, the whole economic system around the movie industry. Or having a small company from Scotland go all the way down to northern Spain and implement a solution to uh, revive agricultural tourism in organic food, for example. You know, it's amazing connections that they would never be able to do. We had a small company from Barcelona that had an amazing technology. For three years, it, they went nowhere. They won the challenge of Taipei in Taiwan. And shortly after, they got two big companies that went in and said, we want that solution. And now they got capital, they're, uh, they're flourishing. Right? It's, these are success stories, right? Sounds amazing and so on. There's a lot of hard work, of course. All these colors are the solutions that um, have currently been implemented, and the ones over here are the solutions that might be chosen for, for this year. So by May 2012, when we've done our last event, we've had 35 cities published call for solutions, 1,500 solutions from around the world evaluated, uh, 39 pilots announced, and a lot of experts have looked at these solutions and actually giving them an evaluation. How good are they? You, know. so you might say these numbers are amazing, and you might say that's not a lot, but the, the thing is we want to make this very, very big. We want to create a global market where this is a standard, where you as a small company, for no money at all, can market your solution to cities around the world and get an uptake. You know. And if they end up buying it amazing, but it will most likely be your only chance of setting this internationally, and hopefully we can save a lot of money in this kind of ecosystem around smart services. 
Um, <clears throat> this is just to explain a little, you know, what, what a company like eDebt can, can save. <coughs> On top of that, we also understand we need to embrace technology. It's not enough for us to have just a, a, an interface, which is a, <coughs> an annual event. So we're creating a website, and that website will be, uh, will do exactly the same, just uh, we'll do it continually across a year. And we'll slowly map out all the cities that are interested in this around the world and all the companies we can get our hands off, right? It works in the following way. This is just to explain the basic principle. Your company like eAdept, you show this is what we do in a very short format to a city. If you as a city is interested, you can say, look guys, this is interesting, contact me. So we are trying both to shield the procurement manager of a city from being spammed by companies that want to sell their service. And on the other hand, explain what does a company like eAdept actually do in a way that can be understood by a procurement manager <coughs> or anyone else with budget responsibility or a politician that's interesting and get that uh, conversation going between them. Then we are building up a database. We have around 700 solutions now and we want to have 25,000, 50,000, how many we can find around the world and it will probably be more when the smart cities uh, hold this course really takes pace. So you can go in and say, look, we have a problem with gum in our city here, and we have a solution here for that. We might be interested in speaking with you guys. Instead of them having to travel around to a thousand cities to get 900 no's, they only get the yeses. Right? So it solves two problems. First of all, we make a promise to the, to, the, to the city saying, look, the companies in your city can go international. The amazing products you have can be sold internationally. And we also go the other way, we say, and you, you know, do not have to invent everything locally here. You can go abroad and see, are there any challenges we have where there's actually a solution, or anything where we might come up with a better solution than having to invent it ourselves. That is what we're doing very shortly. So in the end, all that it boils down to is that we want to change the life for the citizen, you know, and we want to do this through public procurement. The funny thing is that we didn't actually see it as a procurement <laughs> issue until we met a, um, a woman who had created um, a huge project for shelters for the homeless in, uh, in New York City and now was, you know, expanding her project and she said, look what you guys are doing, it's all about procurement, you know. With procurement, we have a key to change the world. This is what we're trying to accomplish. Thank you very much.